It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my first question is for the Deputy Premier. No one should be stuck waiting for days in a hospital hallway when they're dealing with serious illness. Yesterday, the Premier held a press conference where he announced a plan for temporary relief. That sounds exactly like the Band-Aid solutions the previous government had been announcing. Can the Deputy Premier explain if this is even a new plan or just a continuation of the old Liberal one? Deputy Premier. Well, thank you very much for the question, and I can tell you that this is good news for the people of Ontario. The announcement that we made yesterday. We are following up on the promises that we made during the election campaign, both in terms of building more long-term care beds and ending hallway medicine. And I can say to the uh, Leader of the Opposition that this is on top, this is 90 million new dollars here, here, on here, top here. of that 187 million that has previously been spent here, on this. Here. This is a lot of money. Is it an answer? No, because we were left with 15 years of chaos, with a lack of planning, with hospitals that are over 100 percent in many parts of this province. But what it is going to do is help those hospitals with the highest need deal with and get through the flu season where we expect many more hospital admissions. This is going to be a huge help. Across Supplementary. Deputy Premier should know that hallways aren't only filled during flu season, but the reality is constant overcrowding and a scramble for spaces. When is the government going to commit to permanent beds, Speaker? Deputy Premier. Well, we are certainly very well aware that many hospitals across the province are at over 100 per cent capacity. We are working on a long-term capacity plan. Unfortunately, it wasn't ready for this season, a flu season, because we've only been here for several months, but we are working on a long-term plan that will allow for all hospitals in Ontario to operate at safe levels throughout the year and not just at flu season. Final supplementary. Speaker, across Ontario, we see hospitals operating at maximum capacity and beyond. In Thunder Bay, the hospital has been operating at surge capacity for years. In Windsor, the hospital campuses are operating at 99 to 106 percent capacity. And everywhere, patients languish in hallways waiting for treatment. Does the government have a plan, and can they tell us when they might be able to produce a plan to move beyond Band-Aid funding? Deputy Premier. Well, the issue of ending hallway health care is not one simple solution. It is a multifaceted problem, and we are working at all facets of that problem right now. As the member will know, part of the problem is with respect to alternate level of care patients, people who don't need to be in hospital but don't have a place to go. We have over 30,000 seniors that are waiting for long-term care space. So we're working on both easing the hospital congestion, having a place where those where the, the ALC patients can go, but we're also building up capacity in long-term care. So yesterday we also announced 6,075 new beds out of the 50 Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is also for the Deputy Premier. You know, for a patient waiting with cancer in a hallway for days while receiving treatment, the new government seems to be moving from bad to worse. In a recent speech to the Ontario Hospital Association, the Minister of Health told hospitals that they would have to prepare for lean financial times. Can the Deputy Premier explain how cuts to health funding will clear crowded hospital hallways? Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And to you, I would say to the Leader of the Official Opposition, that is not the case. We are not cutting health care funding for people on the front line. We are not cutting hospital beds. We want to increase 
key beds that are available for people. We want to increase the services that people can receive. There is no question that one patient being treated in a hallway is one patient too many. We can all agree on that. And what we want to do is make sure that people are treated in hospital rooms, not in hallways and in storage rooms. That is what we are working hard on, we're concentrating on, to make sure that people can get into those rooms and that those patients who are alternate level of care can either go home with proper levels of home support or they can go to a long-term care facility. Response. Every patient deserves to be in a place that is safe and comfortable for them. Exactly. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, for patients worried about whether a hospital be, will, bed will be there when they need it, this government's approach to health care is concerning. Warning hospitals that lean financial times are coming is, uh, I think, uh, a warning that says, get ready for, for even Niagara more West cuts to, order. to hospitals. King Vaughan, to order. What cost-saving measures is the government contemplating in the health care budget, Speaker? Deputy Premier. I think the Leader of the Official Opposition will know what the financial state of affairs is for Ontario right yeah, now. It has been clearly, it's been clearly demonstrated by the Minister of Finance. So there's no question that all areas of government are going to have to look at their operations and understand how you can find efficiencies. But that, that does not mean is making cuts on the front line. Absolutely not. What we need to do is look internally, look at our processes, how do we do things. Things have been done the same old way in health care for many years. We've got to look under every stone and find out where we can find those savings. We know that hospitals are under a lot of pressure. We know that they're in surge capacity. We want to make things easier for them, not more difficult. Yeah, yeah. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, modernization, transformation, efficiencies are the same words that the Liberal That's government right. used to pack our hospitals and our health care system. And you know what? Unfortunately for the Premier and the Deputy Premier, people remember what happened the last time Conservatives controlled hospitals Mr. in Transportation Ontario. 6,000 nurses were fired and compared to outdated hula hoops. You remember that, Speaker? 28 hospitals were shuttered all over the province, closing 7,000 hospital beds. Many of the same players Mr. from that era, Speaker, order. have returned, come to order. and one of them is heading up the Premier's health care task force. Does the Deputy Premier really think that that is the path forward? Deputy Premier. We are looking at the path forward from 2018 on. We are not looking at what happened in the past. We are looking at how do we deliver health care in the 21st century. What changes do we need to make? The leader of the official opposition may not realize, but still much health care communication is transported via faxes. That is ridiculous in this day and age. We need to modernize our technology and we need to move forward and look at the ways that we can deliver health care more efficiently. <laughs> Telehealth care, making sure that people in remote areas can have specialist consultations without having to travel hundreds of miles in difficult weather. These are the things that we're talking about doing that are better patient care and can be delivered at a lower cost. That's what we're concentrating on, Bonds. and that's what we'll continue to work on in the coming years. Next question. Next question. The member for Windsor to come. Why, well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Good morning, Minister. Windsor Regional Hospital has struggled with overcrowding for years, and now things are getting even worse. Today, the Met campus is at 99% capacity. The Willette campus is at 106. Wait times in the ER are unbearable. There's no room. Some patients are left on gurneys in the hallways. It'll only get worse when the flu season gets here, Speaker. When will this government do the right thing once and for all and give Windsor hospitals the funding they need to get patients out of the hallways and into the hospital beds they deserve? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. I do know that there are many hospitals in Ontario that are over 100 percent capacity right now, which is making it very difficult for health care professionals to deliver the quality of care that they want to deliver and for patients 
who are left in hallways, storage closets, boardrooms, um, every available space in a hospital. We want to ease that situation. It has been building up over a number of years, the previous 15 years. We are trying to figure the situation out and develop a comprehensive health capacity plan. Uh, which we are working on actively right now, but we also had to be prepared for this year's flu season and we had to put in this short-term funding, this $90 million that's going to aid those areas that were determined by the ministry to be in the greatest need. I know there's need across Ontario, but those Response. areas that had the most urgent care needs. Supplementary. Speaker, Windsor families deserve so much better. For years, the Liberals cut and froze hospital funding. To be fair, they gave a little bit more to prepare for the flu season last year, but that was too little and too late. And now the Conservatives are giving hospitals $10 million less than what the Liberals did. Speaker, why is this government forcing more people to wait even longer and making the overcrowding crisis even worse? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, in actual fact, what has happened is the $187 million that the uh, Liberals were talking about was spent last year by them, but also spent by us this year. That money has flowed. So the additional $90 million is new money new on money. top new of that $187 million. It absolutely is true. And that is why, because we know there are those urgent needs across the province, that we are adding to that capacity because we know that the uh, hospital emergency department admissions have increased this year. There's more pressure on the system, and that's why we want to make sure that those hospitals have the assistance they need. But as for Windsor itself and for other hospitals across the province, we are looking at a long-term capacity plan that will be in place by this time next year so we won't have to deal Spons. with emergency funding for flu season. Well here, here. Next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to first off wish you and everybody in the House today a very happy Thanksgiving. I hope everybody happy has Thanksgiving. just a little too much to eat this weekend. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Earlier this week, the federal government reached a last-minute trade agreement with the United States. The deal comes after months of uncertainty, yeah. uncertainty that has hurt families and businesses across Ontario and across our country. Could the minister please outline for the House how the new Canada-U.S. trade agreement fails Ontario workers and leaves many Ontario businesses in a state of uncertainty? Mr. Economic Development Speaker, uh, thank you to uh, my colleague, the member from Willowdale. Now that we've seen the uh, details of the new NAFTA, this is what we're facing. Tariffs remain on steel and aluminum with no timeline or plan for lifting them. We now have a limit on how many cars Canada can export to the U.S., as well as a quota for future investment in Ontario. Canada gave more market share to American dairy exporters, leaving less business for Ontario with no plan to help our farmers. And now the United States now has veto power over future trade deals involving Canada. Highly unusual and a real hit on our sovereignty as a nation. The federal government gave up a lot. With no plan to deal with the impact, our government will continue to demand that the federal government live up to its obligations and treat the people of Ontario and our farmers and workers with respect. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. It is frankly astounding that our federal government is willing to leave Ontario workers and Ontario businesses out to dry. While they trumpet their deal, farmers in our supply-managed sectors await answers on the compensation they will receive, and tens of millions of dollars of investment is on hold. Steel and aluminum tariffs are still in place, and businesses have yet to receive the money the Feds promised. Would the minister please outline for the House what he is doing to ensure that Ontario businesses get the support they deserve from our federal government? Minister of Economic Development. Very good question indeed. Uh, we continue to stand for Ontario workers and will hold the federal government accountable for the treaty that they've signed. Yesterday I sent a letter to uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister Freeland, demanding answers about the USMCA. Our government wants to know, and Ontario businesses and workers want to know, what is the plan to mitigate the impact of this deal. 
We've made it clear that new uncertainty that's been created by the federal government is hurting Ontario families, businesses and workers. I received a response yesterday afternoon from the minister, and I was shocked. Speaker, we got a boilerplate response Shame. with no answers to our questions for the people and workers of Ontario. The people of Ontario and the workers of Ontario deserve to be treated better by their federal government. Question: The leader of the official opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the uh, deputy leader, or the deputy premier, rather. Uh, every day we hear from women and men who are struggling to make ends meet on the current minimum wage. They value being able to take a sick day and emergency days, but they feel like they're not being heard. The minister has said that she's studying the issue, but the premier said his mind is made up. He's freezing their wages and taking away their sick days. Who did the premier consult with to make that decision, Speaker? Deputy Premier. The minister of Economic Development. Minister of Economic Development. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, we. Uh, been doing roundtables, my uh, parliamentary assistant Michael Parsa, uh, doing small business roundtables and red tape, parliamentary assistant uh, Donna Skelly on NAFTA, and believe it or not, NAFTA. We hear after electricity, Mr. Speaker, the number one issue for our job creators, our businesses, small, large, and medium in this province is Bill 148. And the worst of Bill 148 is scheduled to come in on January 1st. So, yes, we are studying because we owe it to the people that attend these meetings, the people that write us, the people of Ontario, and we owe it to the workers of Ontario to make sure they have the dignity of a job. So we're studying every aspect of Bill 148, and we'll have more to say in the future. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, people that we've heard from, some would call them the little guy, are telling us that they're falling further and further behind on the current minimum wage. They say they're working uh, multiple jobs, Speaker. They don't see their children because they have to go from job to job. They say tax cuts won't make a difference because they don't earn enough to pay any taxes in the first place. They deserve to be heard, Speaker. Is the government going to hear from people who have to live on their minimum wage as they make decisions that will have a huge negative impact on people's lives? Minister. Well, uh, Speaker, through you, I say to the honourable member, uh, workers did get a 20 per cent increase uh, this year, which is the largest in the 28 years I've been in this place, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we just think it's time, and we said this in the campaign, and we said this when we voted against Bill 148. I know you guys supported it, propping up the Liberals, as you did 97 per cent of the time over there. But you've managed to kill an awful pile of jobs, and I don't see any apologies over there for the mess you've made. Bill 148 should never have seen the light of day. If I uh, quote the Ontario Chamber of Commerce in a news release this week, it says Bill 148 was too much too fast and has forced our members to decrease product offerings, increase the price of products, hire fewer employees, reduce services and hours of operation, and cut, cut back on employee benefits. Congratulations, NDP, for helping the Liberals put us in this mess. And I would remind all members and ask them to make their comments, make their comments through the chair. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Simcoe North. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Hey, hey. <laughs> My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, <laughs> Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, the USMCA announcement this week has been concerning for our supply-managed farmers. The federal government had stated that no deal would be better than a bad deal for Canada. Yet the news for our dairy farmers has summed up to be exactly that, a bad deal. The federal government had been negotiating our new trade deal for months and assured us that they would make no concessions, yet concerning concessions were made. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can the minister assure us that this government will work with our farmers in reviewing the impacts of the new deal? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the member from Simcoe North for being a champion for the farmers in her riding during these difficult times. 
Our government is committed to standing up for our farmers, especially those affected by the results of the U.S. MCA. During the negotiations, the Premier met with officials in Washington to ensure the concerns of our farmers stayed top of mind. I have been in constant communication with the farmers on these issues. Unlike the federal government, we will work hard to make sure that our farmers receive the clarity they deserve on how they will be compensated. Our government is committed to doing better, standing up for our farmers. They deserve better. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to the minister for his answer and for working hard to make sure that our dairy farmers are compensated accordingly. <laughs> our supply managed industry in Ontario assures that we supply the amount of food needed for Ontario consumers, and our farmers depend on that market for stability. By opening up market access to the United States, our farmers are no longer have the stability they depend upon in prices and in supply. I know the minister and our premier have both met with our supply managed sectors to discuss these issues. Can the minister tell us what they are hearing from our supply managed sectors on the new USMCA? Minister. Well, thank, thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the supplementary question. We, as she said, we have met with representatives from all of the supply managed sectors to discuss the impact of the USMCA. With market access being given through the CPTPP, and now more access given through the USMCA, our farmers are concerned with the profitability and sustainability of their livelihood. We will continue to urge the federal government to provide full and fair compensation for our farmers. I want to assure the member that our government is committed to making Ontario open for business, and this includes ensuring Ontario dairy farms remain open for business as well. Thank you very much for the question. Next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. The flu season comes every year, and yet each year the Liberals and now Conservatives leave health care professionals and Windsor families guessing just how bad things will be. After years of Liberal cuts and funding freezes, our hospitals are in crisis. Rather than doing the right thing and finally giving the hospitals the funding they need to end this overcrowding crisis, the Conservatives are taking the same piecemeal approach as the last government, but this time with even less funding. Speaker, how many people in Windsor will be left languishing in emergency rooms and hospital hallways because this government continues to deny hospitals the funding they need to make things better? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Well, I wish it were just as simple as the member suggests. Just yeah. throw money at the hospitals yeah. and the problem yeah. disappears. Yeah. That is not the way it works. Ending hallway health care is a multifaceted problem. And it We have to make sure we don't have as many emergency admissions. We need to work on mental health and addiction issues So, because we have patients cycling in and out constantly. We need to look at getting the patients who are alternate level of care out of the hospital and either back home where they want to be or if they can't be there into a long-term care home. So we are, we are investing in long-term care homes. We made the announcement yesterday about 6,075 hey. new spaces. And this, the problem with overcrowding in hospitals is something that's been going on for 15 years where nothing was done. I wish I could say we could snap our fingers and make that problem disappear overnight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. It's actually called investing in every Ontarian in this province, not just Conservative insiders and friends. Leave it to the Conservatives to re-announce temporary funding with $10 million less than last year and then tout it as progress. By cutting temporary funding that was already too low, this government is going to make things even worse and life even harder for Windsor families struggling to get appropriate space in a hospital. The bottom line is that Liberal and Conservative temporary funding photo ops won't fix a hospital overcrowding. Speaker, will this government do the right thing and give hospitals the $300 million they need to stop the holy medicine crisis from getting worse? Yes or no? Minister. 
Speaker, thank you. I think it's important for the people who may be watching today's proceedings to correct the uh, statement that was made by the member with respect to funding. In fact, there was $187 million spent last year by the Liberals. There was $187 million spent this year by our government, and the amount that we announced is a new announcement of $90 million. This is good news for people across the province. Is it the entire answer? No, but it's a very good Bots. step forward, and it's going to help hospitals during flu season. But I would just like, if I may, Mr. Speaker, to read a statement from Dr. Gary Newton, who's the president and CEO of the Sinai Health System. On behalf of our patients, their families, and our staff, I would like to thank Minister Elliott for this investment in beds at Bridgepoint Active Healthcare. Anyone? Thank you. Thank you. Next question, member for Scarborough Guildwood. The question is to the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, the quality of life that we have in Ontario is something that we should work hard as legislators to protect. Last night, um, I was actually with the member from Scarborough Agent Court, and uh, it was the 83rd homicide in Toronto. Uh, we witnessed um, families uh, walking home from school, gripping the hands of their children, trying to keep them safe. In light of the horrific incidences of gun violence that is plaguing our streets and our communities in Ontario, does this government support the ban of handguns? Thank you, Deputy Premier. To the uh, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for that question. As we have demonstrated, our government has and continues to take action to combat gun and gang violence, restore public confidence, and ensure our streets and communities are safe. Mr. Speaker, unlike the last government that looked to cancel the $12 million in funding. We committed $25 million over four years. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's not guns that kill people, it's the people that have guns illegally that kill people. The investment that we're making is a vital first step in Response. combating gun violence, disrupting gang activity, and cracking down on the trafficking of illegal guns in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, back to the Deputy Premier. You know, I don't disagree with the investments that you're making, but even, even community members, even community members, yesterday I spoke to a grandmother who said to me that these incidences that are occurring are putting everyone in the community at risk. And in fact, those that are involved in those criminal activities, they're not afraid of the police, right? So these incidences are becoming more brazen and more prevalent in our communities. And so your investments in police services and Crown attorneys is welcome, but it's not enough. It's not enough and it's not solving the issue at hand. And as a matter of fact, Question. it's also after the fact. So will you stand in this House and support my Bill 30, which bans the sale of ammunition right now in municipalities that need that extra support? Here, here. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I've mentioned, we have made an investment in the, uh, with respect to the guns and gangs in the province of Ontario, starting in Toronto. The new equipment and innovative investigative technologies will have an impact with respect to the gun violence that we're experiencing. Mr. Speaker, our government has been clear in our message that gun violence is a menace to Ontario communities and will not be tolerated in any form. The status quo has failed, Mr. Speaker, and our party is the only party in the legislature that's committed to doing something about it. 
Mr. Speaker, we have made a commitment to ensuring that our streets are safe. We will continue supporting our police services that are doing an, an amazing job with the tools that they have, and we will continue supporting them in all their work to ensure that our communities are safe. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Brampton South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and, and Trade. Uh, DeRosier Automotive Consultants have uh, reported that new light vehicles were down by 7.4% in September compared to last year, the largest single drop since uh, 2009. The auto industry uh, is an integral part of Ontario's economy and employs thousands of people. DeRosier said Tuesday that uncertainty surrounding North American trade negotiations may have contributed to the drop in sales. Many questions still remain regarding what supports Ontario workers and families will get from the federal government. Can the, can the minister please inform the members about how the uncertainty surrounding NAFTA and tar tariffs affected Ontario workers and industries? Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, and uh, thank you to my colleague for the uh, question, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the federal government should have gotten a better deal under the uh, USMCA. Ontario jobs, Ontario families, and Ontario industries are paying the price, including our auto sector. We stood shoulder to shoulder with the federal government throughout the negotiations because we knew that a deal needed to get done. However, Mr. Speaker, we were very clear that a deal needed to get done that protected the agriculture, steel, and aluminum sectors of our economy. And Mr. Speaker, that is not the deal that we got. The federal government must come forward and be honest with the people about how they're going to support and fairly compensate those affected by their deal. And it has to be federal money. It's an international treaty. They need to stand by the Constitution, stand up for workers and jobs in Ontario and across the provinces and territories, Bonds. and fairly compensate the people they've hurt. Sure, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. <laughs> Our government must stand up and protect Ontario industry, whether it's autos or agriculture. The Bank of Canada has stated that because of the uncertainty in tariffs, the Canadian GDP will shrink by two-thirds of a percent by 2020. Wow. Wow. The deputy governor of the Bank of Canada has also said, after just a couple of months, the tangible effects of the cross-border uh, tariffs on steel, aluminum, and consumer goods have already started showing up in the economic data. I am very concerned about the current tariffs and what our federal government is doing to mitigate the threat of future tariffs. Can the minister please inform the members what effects the continued steel and aluminum tariffs have on Ontario's industries? Minister. Well, thank you again to the, uh, the honourable member for question and speaker the federal government uh, certainly missed uh, an opportunity to keep uh, section 232 tariffs on the negotiating table throughout the talks they told us it had nothing to do with the talks but in technical briefing on monday uh, page 4 says uh, they tried to talk to the americans the americans rejected rejected them but they didn't bring them back they just they just took the americans word for you know fine you know, we'll kill our steel and aluminum industry. Uh, the member for Sault Ste. Marie, Mr. Morano, was just telling me in a, in a story this morning uh, out of Sault Ste. Marie that Algoma, it's cost them $55 million just in three months of steel and aluminum tariffs, steel tariffs in, in their case, $55 million. That'll eventually hurt every Ontarian because it'll be into the price of your appliances, it'll Spons. be into the price of your cars, it'll be into the price of your building materials, it'll be into the price of the steel that we used for industry of all types, Thanks, and that's going to hurt every person in the province of Ontario, so the federal government needs to get the job done. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, member for Sudbury. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, in my riding of Sudbury, Health Sciences North has been underfunded for years, and under the previous Liberal government, funding was cut again and again, requiring frontline health care workers to do more and more with less and less. And despite pre-election promises from the Premier that no one would be laid off, the hospital is laying off 60 nurses and cutting services. Short-term Band-Aid funding will not help those frontline workers and will not help solve years of neglect. And after years of waiting, Sudbury needs to know 
When will this government be putting forward a long-term plan to end hallway medicine? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Um, thank you for the question. We are actively working on a long-term capacity plan um, as we speak. That is something that we will have in place in advance of the flu season for next year. But as far as your hospital is concerned, I would say that there have been on some unfortunate problems for the last year or so. There is a significant uh, debt there that they are working with the, uh, with the Lynn to try and deal with. With respect to the nurses, they are either going to be uh, retiring or they are going to just they're, they're moving on elsewhere. They're, no one is actually losing the job. So it's important that though that they continue to operate the hospital and that is why the ministry the lynn and the senior senior executives at the hospital are working on a long-term solution supplementary thank you speaker back to the minister uh, i agree the hospital is making difficult decisions but it comes down to funding and years and years of underfunding hospital overcrowding is the number one issue of the people in the riding of sudbury it's the number one thing i hear about we're dealing with a hallway medicine epi epidemic that impacts patient care all year long, not just during flea season, flu season. It's been going on for years and years. Our hospitals are stuck making difficult decisions. Our frontline health care workers are doing their best with limited resources. But morale is low, and many are left wondering if their jobs will be next on the chopping block. Attrition, layoff, otherwise, we're short-staffed. I join you in blaming the previous government for years of underfunding. Right. But will the minister listen to the people of Sudbury and fund our hospitals properly? That's what we need to know. Thank you. Minister of Health, Martin Kip. Well, there's, there certainly is something that we can agree on, that this is a problem that's been growing for many, many years, 15 years, I, I would say, of the uh, Liberals, and now we are, we are left with that situation we are, we are trying to fix. We know it's not going to be an overnight solution. We look forward to working with you and the, your constituents in your riding to find solutions. It has been suggested by a number of hospitals, I would say particularly at this point, medium-sized hospitals, that the funding formula does not work for them. Um, I would suggest it probably doesn't work for many hospitals. So we are taking a look at funding formulas right now as well to determine what the best way of compensating and providing hospitals with the funds that they need in order to operate and to, at the capacity they, where they want to operate, not at 120 per cent capacity, at a comfortable Response. level so the health care professionals will be able to do the great work that they're doing in the, all of our communities in the way that they want to be able to do it, and that patients will receive the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Many people in the agriculture industry, are, in my riding, are concerned about the impacts of USMCA. Farmers like Tara and Randy, processors like Mike, suppliers like Paul. Much of the discussion surrounding the USMCA has been focused on its impact on dairy farmers within the supply-managed industry. I'm aware that the Minister and the Premier met with supply-managed farming organizations to discuss the impacts of the New Deal. Can the Minister also let us know what the agri-food business is saying about the new trade deal? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Kawartha Lakes, um, from uh, Peterborough, Kawartha Lake. I, I want to thank you for the question and bring attention to our agriculture industries impacted by the USMCA. We all know that the USMCA negatively impacts supply-managed farmers. However, we also heard from many of our processors following the New Deal. They're concerned with the millions of dollars in investments in their businesses that are now risky due to greater market access, market access given to the United States. In fact, Gay League Cooperative said this week the deal would have, quote, destabilizing and detrimental impacts on the Canadian dairy industry. Our government is committing to keeping jobs in Ontario and, furthermore, in creating new jobs in Ontario to reflect that Ontario is open for business. Response. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for bringing attention to the agriculture industry's impact by the USMCA. I've heard from many of our processors following the New Deal. They're concerned with the millions of dollars in investments that their businesses are now risking due to the greater market, ac greater market access given to the United States. In fact, Gay Lee said this week the deal will have 
quote, destabilizing and detrimental impacts on the Canadian dairy industry. Can the minister outline how Ontario will continue to be open for business in agri-food? Minister. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to uh, thank the, uh, the member again for being a champion for your farmers. As mentioned previously, our supply management system in Ontario is designed so that our farmers produce only the amount of goods that are consumed by Ontarians. This system provides pricing and supply dependability for our farmers. As we continue to review the impacts of the deal of our supply managed sectors, I assure you that the impacts on chicken, turkey and egg farmers will be treated with significant importance. My, I myself will be cooking two turkeys this Thanksgiving weekend in support of our turkey farmers. And, may, they may need, and I may need some relatives to help come and eat them. If interested, John. my invitation is still open to my critic across the aisle to join us for Thanksgiving dinner. Start the clock. Next question, member for Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Was to cancel regulations that would have stopped vaping companies from promoting their products to children. And then last week, the government introduced Bill 36, which comes with new regulation that allows e cigarettes and vaping products to be promoted and marketed to children in convenience stores. Tuesday, a coalition of health organizations, including the Canadian Cancer Society, the Ontario Heart and Stroke Foundation, called on this government to put the health of children first and to withdraw this regulation. Will the minister listen to these health care professionals and make sure that vaping company and e-cigarette company cannot promote and market their harmful products to our kids? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I think we can certainly agree that the health and safety of children and young people is our utmost priority for everyone in this House. And the uh, regulations with respect to vaping were um, conducted, and there is some suggestion with respect to vaping for adults that it may lead to um, smoking cessation. But as far as children are concerned, there are regulations that are already in place in stores and so on that sell vape, uh, vaping products to make sure that they're not um, available to children, to be sold to children. Those, re the, those will remain in place and uh, those protections will stay there. That won't be disturbed by this change. Supplementary. I want to make a clear speaker most of the vaping company are owned by big tobacco company, which are desperate to hook the next generation to their addictive products. They want to pretend that vaping nicotine is harmless, even though studies show clearly that nicotine is just as addictive if you smoke it than if you vape it. They want to normalize vaping, vaping for kids, and they want to make it look really cool. Above all, what they really want is to get kids addicted to nicotine to make them customers for life. When will the minister withdraw this harmful regulation and make sure that kids are not exposed to vaping marketing, promotion or display? Minister. Well, the regulation is as it is. People can comment. Of course, I'm willing to listen to what people have to say. I want to protect children as well. That is very important, and no one wants to see a, a young person uh, get started with nicotine, and who knows where, where it may go from there. But, but I, it is important to note that stores have responsibility with respect to the placement of these products, not to sell them to children. We expect them to live up to what their requirements are and make sure that children are safe. We will do take other Once. steps to make sure that children are safe, and we want to make sure that we have a public campaign, a public health campaign, to let people know about vaping, to let people know about cannabis, to let people know about alcohol. They may be legal, but they're not benign. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for King Vaughan. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. While we remain hopeful that the USMCA will benefit our economy, I'm pleased that the Minister sent a letter to the federal government demanding answers on this deal. Let us evaluate what the Prime Minister gave up versus what we got in return. Under this deal, the Prime Minister backed down on protecting our dairy farmers. He backed down on Canadian control of our auto industry. Speaker, he backed down on affordable prescription drug prices. He backed down on ending Buy American provisions. We, we, the Liberals backed down on tariff-free access for steel, aluminum and software lumber, and the Liberals gave a foreign government the power to override future trade deals. What? Speaker, through you to the honourable member, did the federal government sign away our sovereignty in this new trade deal? Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Thank you to my, my colleague. Uh, what an important uh, question that is, and the answer, of course, is yes, they did, and Canadians should be shocked uh, at this very fact. We're extremely concerned that the deal forces Canada to inform the U.S. of any intention to pursue negotiations with a non-market economy like China. This is about our sovereignty indeed, Mr. Speaker. Clause 32 gives the U.S. sweeping powers for the first time to override Canada's future trade deals. If we sign a deal with a country like China, the clause says we could be kicked out of NAFTA. Shame. Speaker, because of this new NAFTA, it's more important than ever that we have new trade deals with Japan, with China, with Asia, more with Europe, uh, South America, Bonds. African continent, uh, the rest of the world, because we need those jobs, we need those good-paying jobs. We've benefited greatly from the old NAFTA, not so much with the new NAFTA, so we need Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Minister, Speaker. I am very concerned that the federal government would brazenly sign away our sovereignty. This legislature should speak with one voice in the defence of our industry, in the defence of our sovereignty, and in the defence of our economy. We should be united in holding the Prime Minister to account and count on this minister and this premier to deliver the message to our Prime Minister to do your job and to fight for our workers. Because, because, Mr. Speaker, never has so much been given up with so little in return. Yeah. Speaker, as our government works to diversify our export markets to create good jobs in this province, can the minister inform this legislature if the federal government has, been, has provided answers on why President Trump has a veto over future trade deals in this country? Thank you again to, the, uh, to uh, my colleague for the question. Um, I think we've also, Mr. Speaker, been alarmed at the lack of a meaning meaningful response from the federal government. Mm -hmm. Even a recent policy advisor to the Prime Minister said he was concerned. He said, quote, it's troubling to provide another country with a formal role in vetting Canadian trade negotiations. No Mr. Speaker, the people of Canada, the people of Ontario that did vote for the federal Liberal Party did not vote for that party and Prime Minister Trudeau to give away our rights to be a sovereign nation, to make trade deals, to be proud Canadians and not subject to the Americans. That is not what this country was built on. That's not what our ancestors fought on. That's not what our troops fought in Afghanistan, world wars, Vietnam. We fought to be a sovereign nation, not to give our rights to the Americans. Shame on Trudeau, shame on the federal government. Thank you. Next question, the member for Timmins. Well, there's the old Jim Wilson I used to know. <laughs> oh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Deputy Premier. Pre Deputy Premier, you will know we go to the pumps to fill our cars and trucks and we get gouged every time we go. If you live in southern Ontario, you pay, as, you pay 40 cents less for gas than you would do in places like Thunder Bay. If you live in Kanitawong, you're going to probably pay an additional dollar per litre. So your government took the first step. You supported the NDP bill on gas price regulation at second reading. But now you've got to take the next step. Will you allow that bill to be called in committee so that we can bring relief to people at the pumps? Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Finance. Mr. Finance. 
Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, look, our uh, government is committed to reducing gas prices by 10 cents a litre. Right. Right. We've already taken a step by inter by, uh, uh, through the cap and trade system. Speaker, you will have noticed the price of gas has gone down. It's gone down by 4.3 cents a litre. Congratulations to our Minister of Environment. They've taken away the cap and trade tax speaker that not only has reduced the price of gas by 4.3 cents, but has also put $285 back in the pocket of families. And if you're on natural gas speaker, that put $80 more back in the pocket of families, with more coming yet, Speaker. So I congratulate this government on, on bringing real relief to families. Supplementary. Oh, Mr. Speaker, that's laughable through you. We know what happened to the price of gas. It was the winter blend that came online. All across Canada, the price of gas went down. It's part of what happens every season. To stand in this House and say it is up the Conservative government that did it, I didn't know you had such far-reaching power to affect Alberta, British Columbia, Newfoundland, Quebec, and the rest of the country. So I say to you again, if you really want to stand up for people at the pumps, will you allow our bill that we have in committee now to be called so we can bring relief to people at the pumps? Mr. Finance. Well, thank you. I'll tell you how far reaching our power is. We lowered the price of gas by 4.3 cents. Speaker, we remain committed to our promise that we made during the campaign to make life more affordable for Ontario families and for businesses, and we intend to bring that savings not just at 4.3 cents, but a full 10 cents a litre. We'll be looking at it taking off another 5.7 cents a litre, Speaker. That's what this government is all about. It's a government that is for the people, that is returning prosperity to Ontario, that is bringing real relief for families, not just rhetoric, but real relief for families, Speaker. That's what we're doing, and that's what we'll continue to do, Speaker. Question, the member for Brantford Brant. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Oh. As we approach the end of Ontario Agriculture Week, I think it's important that we talk a little turkey before we gobble up our food this Thanksgiving weekend. And when I say talk a little turkey, Mr. Speaker, I'm talking about our supply-managed sectors like dairy, eggs, and poultry that were the focus of the USMCA agreement this week. It's important to reflect on the farmers who bring us the great food and products we consume every day through their hard work and dedication. I know the minister met with the governor of Idaho this week, so before he passes the potatoes, can the minister let us know what he is doing to show our farming families that he supports them? Yeah, yeah. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Brantford Brant for that uh, uh, great question. Following the USMCA announcement, the Premier and I uh, met with our supply managed sector to reassure them that we will continue to press the federal government on providing full and fair compensation to those farmers experiencing losses through the New Deal. I have been in constant contact with our sh uh, stakeholders on the best way to move forward together and to listen to their concerns during this difficult week. We will continue to review the details of the new trade agreement to fully understand how it will impact our farmers and what we can be done to assist them. Farming families are never to be used as the bargaining chip, and our government is committed to supporting our farmers this week 
and every week. Thank you. Supplementary. I thank the minister for his answer, and I know that the minister has a long history of supporting Ontario farmers. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. As we approach Thanksgiving weekend, we look forward to spending time with our families and reflecting on all that we are grateful for. Reflecting on the new USMCA, the federal government has let our farmers down more, well, more than like a relative who gets stuffed before Thanksgiving dinner without bringing, and then forgets to bring the pumpkin pie. Can the minister let us know what our government has cooking to ensure that the contributions of our farmers are recognized and respected? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank the member for the supplementary question. In celebration of Ontario Agriculture Week, I had the opportunity to join the Farm and Food Care Group at Union Station to hand out breakfast sandwiches to commuters and make their morning a little bit brighter. Compliments of Ontario's farmers. I also had a little uh, talk a little turkey of my own with the turkey farmers of Ontario earlier this month, and I will be cooking two turkeys for my family this weekend to support our farmers. And I hope the opposition critic will be able to pass the cranberry sauce without starting a food fight. And I encourage everyone to buy local Ontario produce this week and every week, and I'd like to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. In Ottawa, 150 families are being evicted from the Herringate neighbourhood by the major developer Timber Creek, a $7.5 billion company based here in Toronto. The developer is demolishing their low-income townhomes to make way for more upscale apartments, leaving residents, mostly new immigrants, scrambling to find affordable housing. Sadly, many have been unable to find affordable options in Ottawa's real estate market. Speaker, when will the minister take real action to address the housing crisis in this province? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. Uh, through you to the member for Ottawa Centre, I, I want to thank you. Uh, for that question. I, I'm certainly aware of the situation uh, in Ottawa. Uh, as uh, most of you know, uh, I spent uh, a significant amount of time uh, in that, uh, that city given uh, the tornado that went through uh, several areas of the city. Uh, but uh, while I was there, I, I had a number of people talk to me about uh, supply of housing and housing affordability. And I've had several uh, conversations uh, with uh, Mayor Watson about some of the ideas and some of the innovation that uh, the city is, uh, is working on. Uh, I want to say to the member that uh, the issue of housing supply is, uh, is one that I think we all need to cooperate on, whether it's uh, in the government benches or in the opposition benches. We need to mobilize Response. all of our stakeholders. We need to work together. And I think housing supply is one of the things that uh, our government is going to continue to place as a top priority. Okay. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the minister for his response and his presence in Ottawa during the recent tornado crisis. But, Speaker, there's another tornado unseen that has hit our city, and its name is Timber Creek. This is one of the worst mass evictions in Ottawa's history, and we have yet to see any action from this government to take any serious steps to ensure these families have affordable homes to move, in, to move into. The UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing has called this crisis happening in my city a human rights violation. The residents of Herringate deserve justice, but the developer has failed them. To date, the mayor of Ottawa has also failed them. They're counting on this minister and this government to stand up to, for them. Will the minister end the practice of rent evictions in Herringate and everywhere else in this province so something like this never happens again? Minister. Minister. Again, Speaker, uh, through you to the honourable member, uh, again, I want to thank you for the question. I, I agree that supply of housing 
is a, is a priority for our government. Uh, I, I tend to take a different approach than the, uh, than the member with this question. I, I want to continue to work with municipalities, to work with our 47 service managers and our two uh, Indigenous program administrators, as well as uh, uh, developers, as well as the real estate sector. We, we need to work across uh, lines to ensure that we have an adequate supply, and our government's committed. We've committed at every opportunity to talk about response, more housing, more affordable housing, online faster. We need to streamline the development process, and that's going to involve cooperation, not demonizing the mayor or. Thank you, Member for Perry South Muskoka. My question is for the Minister of the Environment. A few months ago, the voters of Ontario spoke clearly. They elected us on a mandate to bring an end to the ineffective cap and trade program. They also voted for us to stop the expensive, ineffective federal liberal carbon tax, which will increase the price on everything. Since then, the people of Ontario are not the only people across the country who have seen the light. More and more provinces are now seeing the carbon tax and the federal carbon plan for what it is, a cash grab that does little to address the problem of climate change. This damaging policy will increase the price of gas, basic goods like groceries, and make life more unaffordable for everybody. Ontario has shown leadership in standing up to the federal government against a carbon tax. Can the Minister of the Environment update this House as, as to the status of our fight? Minister of the Environment, Conservation Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, um, as this House knows, this government was elected on a promise to do everything we could to fight the regressive job-killing carbon tax yeah, for the federal yeah. Liberals. Now, since that announcement, Mr. Speaker, and I need the list is so long, I need a piece of paper to keep track. Um, yesterday, Manitoba became the last province to reject the federal carbon plan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Add to them Ontario, of course, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, Alberta, and PEI in opposition to the federal carbon wow. plan. The list just keeps growing, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Yeah, yeah. Speaker, I thank the minister for his commitment to this very important promise. Back to the minister. I heard it time and time again at the doors. Families can't afford a carbon tax. It's great to see we are getting support from other provinces in this fight as well. I know that the premier is going out west and will be meeting with other premiers. Canada needs this leadership, someone to talk to the province, to bring them together, to work collaboratively. We need a pragmatic approach, and if the federal government is unwilling to provide that leadership, I'm proud that our Premier, Premier Ford, is doing just that. We all know that hardworking Ontario families just can't afford more taxes. Can the minister assure the families in my riding that we will do everything possible to ensure the carbon tax is not imposed on the hardworking people of our province? Minister. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the member from Muskoka. I, too, am proud of the leadership that our Premier is showing on this issue. He's working hard and reaching out across the country. He's going to Saskatchewan, to Alberta, and who knows, he may even make a stop in Winnipeg on the way back. Wow. Mr. Speaker, while we are showing this leadership, while the Premier is showing this leadership, the federal Liberals are stuck in the mud. They won't, they won't change their tune. The NDP opposition is devoted to a carbon tax, the highest carbon tax in the world. Mr. Speaker, we take our direction from the people. We will put, as the Minister of Finance said, $260 back in their pockets every year. We will do everything we can to stop a regressive, job-killing sure. federal carbon tax. That concludes the time we have for question period today. I, I wish to acknowledge another former member who is in the House today who served at the riding of Niagara Falls in the 36th and 37th Parliament. Bart Mays has joined us today. Welcome. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 98C, a change has been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business such that Ms. French assumes ballot item number 29 and Ms. Andrew assumes ballot item number 41. It is now time to say a word about our legislative pages. These fine young people are indispensable to the effective functioning of this chamber. 
They cheerfully and efficiently deliver notes, run errands, transport important documents throughout the precinct, and make our water glasses make sure our water glasses are always full. We are indeed fortunate to have them here. I'm actually just getting started. Our pages are smart, trustworthy, and hardworking. They depart having made many new friends with a greater understanding of parliamentary democracy and memories that will last a lifetime. Each of them will go home and carry on, continue their studies, and will no doubt contribute greatly to their communities, their province, and their country. We expect great things from all of them. Maybe some of them will someday take their seats in this House as members or work here as staff. We wish them all well. And thank you for showing your appreciation to our pages. We now have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 36, an act to enact a new act and make amendments to various other acts respecting the use and sale of cannabis and vapour products in Ontario. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
I'm going to ask the members to please take their seats. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Will the members please take their seats? Will the members please take their seats? <laughs> On October 1, 2018, Ms. Mulrooney moved second reading of Bill 36. All those in favour will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. <laughs> Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Mr. Smith, Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Bethlenfalvy, Mr. Bethlenfalvy, Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Fidelli, Ms. Elliott, Ms. Elliott, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson, Mr. McLeod, Mr. McLeod, Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, Mr. Yakubuski, Mr. Yakubuski, Mr. Hardiman, Mr. Hardiman, Mr. Bolo, Mr. Tobolo, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. Marteau, Mrs. Marteau, Mr. McDonnell, Mr. McDonnell, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Bailey, Mr. McNaught, Mr. McNaught, Mrs. Fullerton, Mrs. Fullerton, Ms. Scott, Ms. Scott, Ms. Jones, Ms. Jones, Mr. Cho Scarborough North, Mr. Cho Scarborough North, Mr. Phillips, Mr. Phillips, Mr. Lecce, Mr. Lecce, Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka, Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka, Mr. Coe, Mr. Coe. Mr. Gill, Mr. Gill, Mr. Cook, Mr. Cook, Mr. Calandra, Mr. Calandra, Ms. Serma, Ms. Serma, Ms. Ms. Skelly, Ms. Skelly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Trantafilopoulos, Mrs. Trantafilopoulos, Mr. Sicaria, Mr. Sicaria, Mr. Mr. Osterhoff, Mr. Osterhoff, Ms. Midas, Ms. Midas, Ms. Park, Ms. Park, Mr. Hillier, Mr. Hillier, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Nichols, Ms. Kusindova, Ms. Kusindova, Mr. Romano, Mr. Romano, Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris, Ms. Gamari, Ms. Gamari, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Mrs. Carahalios, Mrs. Carahalios, Mrs. Fee, Mrs. Fee, Mr. Cho Willowdale, Mr. Cho Willowdale, Mr. Downey, Mr. Downey, Ms. Kanjan, Ms. Kanjan, Mr. Pacini, Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cram. Mr. Cram. Ms. Wise. Ms. Wise. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mademoiselle Simard. Mademoiselle Simard. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Smith. Uh, Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Court. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Uh, Mr. Bauma. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanigasa. Mr. Tanigasa. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Shrine. motion will please rise one at a time and be counted by the clerk. Ms. Singh, Brampton Centre. Ms. Singh, Brampton Centre. Madame Jalilah. Madame Jalilah. Mr. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Lando. Ms. Lando. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Uh, Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Monta, Mr. Navisha, Mr. Mr. Shaw, Mr. Shaw, Mr. Stiles, Mr. Birch, Mr. Mr. Stevens, Mr. Mr. Gates, Ms. Andrews, Mr. French, Mr. French, Mr. Kernahan, Mr. Kernahan, Mr. Gretzky, Ms. Gretzky, Ms. Taylor, Ms. Taylor, Mr. Hassan, Mr. Hassan, Mr. Bourguin, Mr. Bourguin, Ms. Um, Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Mokosovic. Mr. Mokosovic. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Mr. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Uh, Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. The ayes are 72, the nays are 36. The ayes being 72 and the nays being 36, I declare the motion carried. <laughs> Pursuant to the order of the House dated October 3, 2018, the bill stands referred to the Standing Committee on Social Policy. Before I recess the House, I want to thank and acknowledge the members for the higher standard of decorum that we've set this week, in my opinion. It has been a distinct pleasure to serve as your speaker this week. 
This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.